morning, saints. We are continuing our series entitled Growing in Agape Love. And our text scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And it reads, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move, remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abide in faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for giving us the opportunity, uh, the privilege, once again, to partake of your word. And we thank you, Lord, that your word is food unto our spirits, it's manna from heaven. We thank you that it's a, a guideline for us, it's a lamp before our feet, it sets the path, enables us to have stability and order in our lives, it gives us um, inspiration, it reproves us when necessary, it gives us strength and wisdom and everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. So right now we thank and praise you Father for the opportunity to uh, digest it once again, and as we meditate upon it and apply it in our lives, we thank you, Father, for the fruit in advance that it's going to provide us as well as the people that we interact with. We give you the praise, the honor, and glory for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So as I said, we're continuing on our series, Growing in Agape Love. And over the last few weeks, uh, we first examined why was it necessary then we went on and looked at the fact that each one of us need to mature in love. And quite frankly, we never completely arrive. We go through different levels of maturity, similar to our earthly experiences. But if you have an open mind, even up to your advanced years, there's still a wealth of information that you can grow in. And in a similar manner, there's deeper and deeper uh, levels of love that we can walk in. Uh, as a matter of fact, for instance, you may have started out with having uh, familial love or brotherly love. Uh, you can grow to the fact that you uh, start to love your community. You can love your, your fellow believers, your race, your culture, your nation, uh, just so many different things. But as you truly begin to mature in love, you can find that often your love can extend even to those who previously you may have not had compassion or love for and that's where it really continues to grow and you know as long as we're in these fleshly bodies there's areas that we can still improve upon as it relates to love so I believe that's something that we will continually grow in if we desire to after that we looked at the fact that we need to have a love for God's word amen and quite frankly if we're going to grow in agape love we have to love the word because it gives us the wisdom the inspiration once again the reprovement to adjust our perceptions, our attitudes. Um, it, it governs the way in which we interact with people, how we view things, how we speak, how we act, how sometimes we don't act and speak. So um, loving God's word is critical to us growing in agape love. Matter of fact, we know that Jesus is the word of God and he exemplified 
uh, love as he was here. So that's a perfect reason why we need to grow in love. Uh, we went on to uh, examine the fact that we need to be um, perfected in God's love. We looked at the fact that, uh, uh, well, we looked at how God views those who love his word. Um, and then the major aspect was looking at spirit control character, not fleshly control, not attitude, political position, scientific background, socioeconomic status, spirit control character, amen, where even our flesh doesn't get leadership over how we view and perceive things and act towards people. We went on and looked at the fact we should be non-judgmental. Uh, we should um, realize that our inward act attitude reflects outwardly, even though we may not realize it. And uh, then last week, we looked at the fact that we need to be people who help to maintain unity. If it's present, we help to maintain it. If it's not there, we help to bring it into uh, the situation. So we need to be people that maintain unity. And today, we're going to continue on. We're going to talk about discipline and reconciliation. Discipline and reconciliation. <laughs> Heard a good reaction already. And the first passage of scripture we're going to look at is Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to read verses 5 through 13. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the love, Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let, rather let it be healed. Praise the Lord. So what we see here is that as children of God, we should have the expectation that in the same manner, our earthly parents, if they were good parents, disciplined us and didn't let us just run amok, do anything we desire, um, go around wreaking havoc in our neighborhoods with mischief, um, being insubordinate to our elders, school teachers, or whoever we pass by that would try to guide us in the right direction. If we were truly good parents, amen, we not only showed love and provided a roof over our children's head, um, as children we received that, we also had an expectation that they would feed us, clothe us. If we got sick, they would nurture us and try to get us back quickly to good health. Those are the expectations that we had over our earthly parents, and for those of us who are our parents, that's what we do, amen? So if that's the case, we should also have the expectation as children of God that regardless of the age that we have, amen, he is much older than we are, and we should have an expectation that the same way our parents provide wise counsel, reprovement, uh, punishment if necessary, that our Heavenly Father will do the same thing. And you might say, well, when I reached a certain age, I was doing things my way, and I didn't listen to my parents. There's a lot of young adults that are stumbling economically, stumbling in terms of all these different things because they didn't want to listen to their parents, especially when they reached uh, the age of what they felt was being a grown-up. But uh, good children will continue to listen to their parents. Like We have two sons that are both um, in their, their 20s. They still listen to us and accept wise counsel. That doesn't mean that they always agree with us, but they still listen to what we have to say 
respectfully. And at the end of the day, they have to decide and make decisions for themselves. When they make the right decision, amen, they'll see the blessings of it. If they make the wrong, then they might have to adjust and get themselves back on the right track. But at least they are open to uh, reprovement and, and wisdom and discipline, uh, although it's not the same level of discipline as they had as children. Amen. We discipline them more as men at this age, but the fact is they're still open to that. And once again, going back to us being children of God, are we open to his reprovement and his chastisement? He even goes so far here as to say the, the scourging, amen? <laughs> you think about the scourging, we think of what Jesus Christ endured. And quite frankly, we're getting it easy when it's talking about the chastisement and the scourging that God gives to every son and daughter that's in his kingdom. None of us are taking lashes, amen? We might get a, a scourging or a chastisement from the world system, Amen. We might suffer the consequences of bad decisions, but none of us are dealing with the type of chastisement and scourging that Jesus went through. Amen. So that being the case, we should be wise enough and open enough to God being able to discipline us and guide us. And sometimes God will do that by, in that still small voice, speaking to our spirits. Other times, you know, we'll hear something, amen, more profound, and you can almost tremble at uh, the voice of God or the presence of God when you know you've gone astray and even though he may you may feel that heavier weight of the discipline or the chastisement upon you you still feel the love of God amen he's not just trying to punish you to destroy you no his punishment is still guiding you back to where you need to be and it still has an undercurrent of love that's flowing from it so God never punishes us in the case that we feel like we're worthless and we're being kicked out of the family. No, he might come off harsh at times, amen? And you might get tough love from God, but still you, you feel that fervent love for God, amen? It's almost like a parent that you'll see on an earthly basis. It, you know, it hurts me to punish you, but I see so much more than you. And even though you may not understand why I'm saying this, and it seems to be coming off harsh, amen, I see the greatness that is, that is in you, and I'm not going to accept you being less than what I called you to be. So sometimes we may feel like, God, why are you coming down so hard on me? Or why am I suffering through this? And God is saying, hey, I see greatness. I know what I destined for your life. So I'm not going to accept you being status quo. I'm not going to accept you being broken and inferior and dysfunctional and all over the place. No, I'm disciplining you because I love you and I want greatness and productivity and fruitfulness and success. And the love of God and my character to flow in your life and out of your life into the lives of other people. God has great expectations for us. And that's why he's going to punish us if necessary. Or at least discipline us and give us reprovement. Now here's the thing. You know, none of us from childhood into our adulthood. You know, whether you're dealing with an earthly parent. Or whether you're even dealing with somebody at work. Um, who's a superior. Uh, you may not like being disciplined. Quite frankly, some people resent discipline. They feel it's unfair, unjustified. But at the end of the day, reprovement and discipline and sometimes chastisement is actually good for us because it helps keep us in right standing, amen, with those who are in authority over us. And once again, a lot of times they can see and understand things that you may not grasp. So although you may not understand the discipline and the chastisement, it's actually coming with the underlying purpose to guide you into the right direction and also teach you the wisdom as to why you have to operate or perceive or do things a certain way. You know, discipline isn't done usually for the sake of, I just want to punish you. No, I'm trying to steer you into the right path and let you see things from another perspective that you can't grasp right now. So discipline comes with that purpose. And that's what it does in our relationship with God. God's not just punishing you because he has nothing else to do. He's not reproving and chastising you uh, because, oh, uh, well, I just feel like being critical today, I got up on the wrong side of the bed. No, God doesn't have those types of perceptions or attitudes. No, he's disciplining us, chastising and reproving us because he wants us to, once again, follow the path that he has for us so that we can be in right standing with him to live the most fruitful existence possible and, once again, 
to be a great ambassador of Christ to minister salvation to others, amen, as we walk in, once again, the greatness of what he had desired for us. And if we feel that we cannot receive correction from our earthly parents or superiors, you know, it could be somebody in charge of an organization, it could be somebody in leadership, um, in a committee that you're at, at in church, and it could especially be, you know, confining to the guidelines at your job, uh, to city laws and that sort of thing. If you can't yield to the correction from those things, how in the world can you ever say that you're submitted to God? Amen? If you can't deal, deal with correction and discipline from those who can get right in your face, I hate to say it that way, and tell you about yourself and how wonderful you aren't, although you think you are, if you can't deal with that discipline, there's no way you can honestly state that you'll accept correction from God. Matter of fact, going further, if you fail to receive correction from God, you are basically saying exactly what it said at the beginning of this passage of Scripture. You are a bastard or an illegitimate child. Amen? So that's how harshly God looks at it. If you don't want to accept my discipline, amen, you are illegitimate. Amen? You not treat yourself as if you're a child. It's all, almost as if you're treating yourself as a foster or adoptive child, and because we're not biologically related, we're not true family, you can't discipline me because I'm not a part of your family. You're basically abandoning your kinship with God, amen, from your mindset if you say that God cannot discipline me and I could just live and act and treat people any old way I want, amen. You're saying I'm illegitimate, and that's a sad thing. I have a quote here by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Amen. Ralph Waldo Emerson. And this is such a, a great statement. He says, let me never fail. I'm sorry. Let me never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I am persecuted whenever I am contradicting. <laughs> Just think about that. You know, people have a mindset that, okay, I'm persecuted whenever somebody contradicts or criticizes or tries to correct me. I'll read it again. Let me never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I am persecuted whenever I am contradicted. And if you've ever been in a leadership position, you know a lot of times that there are people like that. You try to give them the slightest correction. You know, they try to do or say something that um, is errant and you share something for their own benefit that, to their mindset, contradicts their perceptions, and they go into victimization mode, I am persecuted, these people are just coming at me for no reason. No, you're not persecuted, you're being corrected. Amen? And as long as you have the mindset that I'm persecuted when you're actually being corrected, you're never gonna learn. Because instead of gleaning the knowledge that is being afforded you, instead, you're basically shutting yourself off from everything you can learn by placing yourself into this flight path of being a victim that's being unfairly berated and barraged by whatever they're saying to you. And as a result, you're running away from the truth of what you need to learn. You're running away from an area in which you can grow. And through victimizing yourself, you never change and you continue to stay immature or full of dysfunction, uh, you lack wisdom because you're unwilling to accept proper correction. So the reality is when somebody is trying to correct you or God is trying to correct you, you're not being persecuted. It might be tough, <laughs> it might be hard to hear, and it might not be a pill that you want to swallow, but correction or contradicting your wonderful beliefs is not persecution. It's simply reprovement, correction, and discipline. Now, let's go to another passage of Scripture. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 27, and we're just going to read verse 6. And it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Let's look at the kisses part first. You know, people will nod their head and just yes you, pat you on the back, 
as we see here, even kiss you. <laughs> and it'll be the same people that kiss you and, sh and show you feign love that when you fall, they're the first one to laugh and judge you and come at you harshly. Amen? And, and that's a sad thing. We see it so many times with celebrities. I just saw an interview with um, David Chappelle. He talked about yeah, everybody loves me now, and everything's so wonderful, and I went down in the ashes of walking away from a multi, multi, multi-million dollar contract, and people are laughing, is he crazy, is he insane, he lost his mind, he walked away, and, and he talked about the, t the down period before he got back to where he is now, and he said, you know, people were mocking me and pointing a finger, and a lot of these people are the same people that applauded me, and you all that, you're the greatest comic, and they ate me alive. As soon as I stumble, amen? So fortunately, he said he didn't buy into that, you know, everybody kissing me is, is necessarily my friend. So it didn't crush him and devastate him as it could. But the funny thing is, though, he said in that process, I wouldn't be who I am now if I hadn't walked away from that, borne all that criticism, borne all the uncertainty, the pain, the fears. You know, he said, if I hadn't gone through all these things, I wouldn't be at the place I am now, amen, appreciating the good things of life. And matter of fact, he said, the good things of life are not my wealth and fame. He said, the good things, I got a 20-year-old son that's brilliant. And I got another son that's, you know, an all-star athlete. And I got a, a daughter that is sharp. He said, I learned to value all these different things. Not that I didn't before, but I have so much a greater pers um, perspective and understanding of the good things of my life, amen, lives in a got a farm out in a small town in, in Ohio. And he says, I, I walk down the streets and I'm just Dave. Hey, Dave. Hey, Ed. Hey, <laughs> Susan. I'm just average old Dave. So sometimes the wounds actually help you. And we see that in his case. But the fortunate thing is that he didn't fall for the kisses of the enemies who ended up mocking him during the time of his downfall. Amen. It didn't allow those things to devastate him. And once again, we see this over and over again, you know, in, in this celebrity world with entertainment, entertainers and athletes. You know, LeBron, everybody supposedly loved him when he was at Cleveland. When he goes to Miami, the same fans in Cleveland that loved him, he's the king, he's the one, burning his jerseys, amen. And he leaves Miami and comes back, the same people that loved him burned his jersey, then he came back, they love him again, it's like, oh, I love the Maybe you burned his last jersey. You forgot about that part. <laughs> so you can't trust, in other words, people who aren't your true friends and who aren't your brothers. You know, they're going to be fickle and up and down. They'll love you one minute and they'll stab you in the back or throw um, boulders and rocks and shoot arrows at you the nets. But then we go to the better part of this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. See, a friend's not going to burn your jersey or, or burn your outfits when you're going through your downfall, amen? They're going to cut you and tell you about yourself while you're in the path of making the mistakes. I'm not going to wait for your downfall. I'm going to deal with you and cut you off the path, amen, to your downfall and, and try to help you avoid going down that path of your downfall. And they may not be able to stop the downfall, but, you know, even though you might fall, they'll be there to try to help pick you back up. They don't kick you down further into your pit. Amen. You don't fall into the pit and you hear the sound of a shovel. You think they're digging you out and know they're throwing dirt into the hole. Amen. Your friends won't do that. They're the ones who will try to help you and cut you off in the past. And if, and if necessary, they will actually, as we see here, will wound you. Amen. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And I was looking at that, and one of the things I thought of is, you know, boxers. You know, uh, a boxer takes a hard shot to his eye, and his eyes start swelling up as the blood starts pooling up. It starts getting fatter and fatter, and if they don't do something about it, the eye will totally close up, and he has to continue to fight with one eye. So what the trainer will do, who is basically serving as an advisor and a coach on the floor or the ring, and somebody who is on your side, he's your ally. He's not out there taking the punches or throwing the punches, but he's your ally as you're out there on your battlefield. When you go into that corner, as that eye starts to swell up, they will actually take a little razor blade cutting, amen, to release some of that flow so you don't swell up and totally go basically temporarily blinded due to the swelling in your eye. Faithful are the wounds. I'll cut you if I need to to keep your eyes open. 
And that's what a friend will do in real life. I can see you're being deceived by the circumstances that you're dealing with right now. Now, you think you're seeing clearly, but sin is clouding your judgment and swelling your eyes up. I'll cut you if necessary to open it up so you can see clearly. Amen? That's what they'll do. And I also thought of another side. It's not, actually, it falls into the wounds of a friend. There's times where you get cut on the other side of the coin that you will bleed out. They don't stop it, so they might take something hot and it to close that wound. So sometimes helping you might cause you some pain, but does it save you? That's the key thing. Yeah. You know, somebody taking something hot to sear, sear that cut, and you feel the pain of that burn, but if they didn't do that, amen, amen. and get that blood flow to stop, you may have died. So I gave you pain. Yes, I burned you, and you screamed in pain when I applied that heat. But I saved your life. Amen. Faithful are the wounds of the friend. And that's the thing. A friend will see that in the moment I might have to hurt you. Matter of fact, in the moment, it might even cost me your friendship because you don't like what I feel I need to say. You know, and it's not like I have joy in that. It pains a friend sometimes to say what you need to hear. But they're willing to pay the cost of even their friendship to speak something into your life that will sometimes save you from yourself. Amen? That's what a friend will do. And that's why it says faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, the wounds are faithful. The friendship might end because, oh, you can't talk to me like that. But they were a friend because they were willing to do it anyway. Amen? A lot of people would be in a better state in their lives if they accepted the wounds of a friend over the kisses and the applause of an enemy. Amen. I said again, a lot of people would be better off in life if they accepted the wounds of a friend over the kisses and the applause of enemies. A lot of people would be doing much better. Amen. Amen. And you hope that when they get older, they come to realize that and they reconcile situations. But um, even if the friendship never comes back, if the person at least gets to the place where, oh, now I see why they said that. You know, I might not be able to rectify or, or mend the breach of our relationship, but oh, now I see the wisdom. Man, they were actually looking out for me. And you develop a appreciation for their willingness to step in when nobody else would. Amen. Amen. So like I said, a godly friend is willing to speak up even when other people around will sit back and do nothing or will even permit you to fall as you're going down the wrong path while an enemy will encourage you to continue on in what is inappropriate, ungodly, unfruitful. You know, people who aren't your true friends will sit there and be yes people once again, nod their heads as you're going onto that path that is going to cause you problems. So at the end of the day, who's the true friend? <laughs> the person is willing to knock you upside your head if necessary. Maybe not literally. <laughs> but verbally, that's the true friend. All right, let's go on to 2 Timothy. And we're going to read chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we see here that, you know, first of all, we need to be ready on our best days and our worst days, amen, to preach the word of God. That doesn't mean you're behind a pulpit with a mic. It's basically, basically saying we need to be ready to proclaim, you know, the principles of God and say, the sort of things that will help lead people to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. These are the things we need to be willing to do. You know, once again, whether we're having a great day or a bad day. You know, some of the worst days of your life, God might actually open up a situation where you could touch the lives of somebody else, especially if you're both going through that same thing in the same moment. You know, you're at a place of work and they announce a major layoff. 
And instead of you joining in with the murmuring, complaining, and the fear, the anxiety, yes, and you may have some of these things, but you, you, you restrain any outbursts or you, you know, just hold back and, hey, I'll let it out at home and cry if I need to, but right now I need to go into concerning myself with their plight and minister to them and say, hey, I'll pray for you and things are going to be okay. You know, that's one of the ways where we can preach the word um, in season and out of season. That's out of season and being a bad moment. But um, you're in season in the fact that I'm ready and poised to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ and his love regardless of the situation. And as we go further on, it says that there's other things we have to be ready to do at all times as well. Not only ready to proclaim, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ in whatever form it might be exhibited or proclaimed. But if necessary, there's times where you're dealing with people and you might have to, once again, reprove them and tell them, like, you're not perceiving things correctly. That's wrong. Sometimes you got to be a little more harsh as well. There's times where you give people a general nudge, like, well, are you sure you're seeing that right? Or, uh, I think you ought to consider this. That's more of a reproving, <laughs> kind of nudging them in the right direction. But then there's straight out rebukes, where you just, you're wrong, <laughs> this is why. And you might come with tough love. Um, and then on the third option, we see exhort people. Sometimes you give people words that will guide them, and you might admonish them some, but you encourage them like, hey, you know, in the midst of all this, and you're perceiving this wrong, and you need to get this together and get your act together, but hey, the reason I'm saying this is because I know you can be better. So you would exhort them even in the midst of the fact that you might have initially reproved or rebuked them. But we see that with that, we need to be long-suffering sometimes. You know, we can't necessarily expect a person the first time we talk to them to just supernaturally absorb everything we say. And, man, it's as if the angels, you know, the clouds opened up and the angel came down and gave me this revelation. And, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> sometimes they're not going to get it. Sometimes they're not going to accept it. So in those cases, we might have to be more long-suffering. You know, we might have to be more tolerable of the fact that they may not accept quickly the things that we need to share to them. But um, here's the thing. Although we might have to discipline people, reprove or rebuke them, we should always do it with love and patience. That's two of the key things that we're seeing here. Amen. We need to have love. And God is charging us to be willing to do that. It's not something that's optional. Each one of us, if we're growing in agape love, this should be considered a responsibility that we are walking in love and we have patience and love regardless of how receptive they may be the first time around to what we need to share. So we need to have that type of mindset, amen, and not be judgmental as we saw earlier on, but be more um, compassionate, have more patience. A lot of times it's working in us greater patience as people don't accept what we have to offer the first time around. So let's go over to uh, Galatians. And we're going to look at chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest, also, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Praise the Lord. Now, um, <laughs> we're quickly, a lot of times we're quick to try to Notify somebody how they're overtaken in a fall. <laughs> they messed up. I'm going to tell them. Um, it's like we have this job as the heralds of you messed it up. <laughs> Amen. But no, God has not given anybody of us that ministry to go around and just judge and criticize and beat down people because of their faults. Matter of fact, it says really, if we want to deal with somebody that's, that's overtaken in a fall, um, and God has given us the, the responsibility to help correct them and guide them in the right direction. First of all, it starts out, 
ye which are spiritual. You're not going in with your fleshly observations, with your agenda, uh, your envision, mindset of what and who they should be. No, it's not about you and your agenda and how you want to package them so that they now get your seal of approval. No, that's not the purpose of uh, dealing with somebody who's overtaken in a fall. You're not molding them into the likeness of you so that now you can approve of their walk either with God or their walk in general. No, they're not going to be patterned after you. You're looking at them from the perspective, once again, of the love of Christ. Amen. You want the best for them. And it may not be your exact definition, but, you know, you come with the mindset that, first of all, I'm going to pray for that person, and I'm going to show them compassion and love. Uh, they may have messed up royally, but I'm going to try to position myself where I'm not coming in being judgmental and dismissive and hard-hearted. But instead, let me share what God has for them as opposed to what I have for them. And a lot of times you can back that up. You know, over the years when Pam and I have... Um, um, minister discipline to people uh, one of the first things we do, we pray for them then we also look at passages of scripture, amen we do our study and it's like okay, well we need to hit on the following points but as we're talking to the person regarding the points which we think can help resolve situations or improve their life, we're sharing those points with scriptures to back up what we're saying, so it's not Brian and Pam Fox's opinion it's like, here's what the word says amen and God has just used us and based upon our prayers here's what we feel by the spirit of God he is leading us to share with you and then you can take it and you can decide hey what you're going to do with the insight that we share amen and we're not even saying that what we have to share is the final conclusion of all things you might get insight from us as you're studying the Lord might take you through other scriptures that give you additional revelation and hey he might even um, lead you to a situation where you get um, different viewpoints or additional scriptures and perceptions from somebody else. Amen. So that's the thing. You take yourself out of it like, oh, I'm right and I tell you how to live. No, it's just I'm sharing what God has for you. Amen. Amen? As opposed to what I want. And he tells us too, those of us who are providing wise counsel to people or discipline, similar to the passage where you know, how you criticize somebody with a moat in their eye when you have a, a whole plank in yours. We're also being cautioned once again, consider yourself before, before you go counseling and judging them because, you know, the same way they got overtaken, don't think your britches are too big that you can't be tempted and led astray or be overtaken by something as well. So we're going in with the mindset that, hey, I'm not better than you because I'm uh, giving you wise counsel, amen? Hey, I'm a person that also has faults. I'm a person that also stumbles, but, you know, God is using me to touch your life and show you love and guide you in the right direction, but I'm not getting cocky about it like, oh, I'm better than you because I'm giving you advice, so therefore I'm better Christian. No, we all have flaws, amen? And God is warning, warning us here, you know, consider yourself lest you also be tempted. Matter of fact, goes further down in verse 3. says, if you think you're something, when you're nothing, you're deceiving yourself. So once again, don't get arrogant just because God blessed you to serve in a role as a role model, a mentor, a spiritual parent, a confidant, a guide, whatever role he places you in in the life of somebody else. It's a blessing and an honor that you're placed in that position. It doesn't mean that you're better than anybody else. Amen? Now, one of the key things, too, that caught my eye, uh, the word fault. That word fault in this passage of scripture means um, a side slip, a lapse or deviation, an unintentional error or transgression. Once again, the word fault means a side slip, <coughs> a lapse or deviation, an unintentional error or transgression. So that person's not just going out there, oh, I decided I'm just going up, up, getting up today, and I'm going to just embark on a path of sin, or, you know, over the course of a week or a month, or whatever time period that I had a series of missteps that 
have now led to you coming into my life to help guide me and get me on the right path. It's not like I sat there and premeditated or schemed how I would make such a mess out of my life. No. You know, I had a side slip, you know, a lapse of or a deviation in my judgment. You know, unintentional errors or transgressions have deceived or just seduced me to take me off the correct path. So therefore, that being the case, we should have you know, a loving attitude once again and be looking to minister in a manner that, that doesn't beat down but helps to bring up that person out of whatever trap that they've been captured in. Amen? We have a loving mindset that we're there to heal, nurture, guide, rescue, support, uplift, not to beat down further and to be dismissive or destroy the person with our attitude. You know, one of the things that came to mind last night is I was looking at the word um, overtaken, and especially where it talks about if a man be overtaken in a fall. It, it brought a, a major question to mind as I studied this again last night for all of us to consider. And the question is, why in the world would we ever expect people who have been overtaken in a fall to repent, abstain from, or adjust their behavior when the word overtaken literally means that their shortcomings have caught up with them and have now taken the lead or are exerting more influence in their lives. The very definition of being overtaken means that something has come upon you. You know, that you were previously in front of it, it has caught up with you, has now, um, Come past, going past you after it caught up with you, and now it is taking the lead. You know, as an example, uh, one of the good examples I can give is like, say you're on the interstate and you're in a car, you know, 295. And you're driving down the interstate, you see a car a mile up, you know, ahead of you. And it doesn't matter whether you're trailing that person, like you're going to the same place, or it's a total stranger. You know, you're in an interstate, you see a car a mile ahead of you, and you drive at a speed that you now catch up with that car, but then you're still going at a speed that eventually you pass them and now you're in front of them. It's the same thing, amen? It's like that person got overtaken. They were ahead of, of the sin that has now consumed their life. But that sin, for whatever reason, caught up with them, and now it's taking a lead. But the problem is, it's taking a lead, but it exerts enough influence that it's now towing them along and taking them down the path. Amen? So, you know, it's like I said, using the analogy of a car, it's like something's in front of you, your vehicle's behind, you catch up, and then you take the lead. And now it's following the path that you're on in front of it. But in this case, the fault, the sin, the transgression has not just caught up and taken a lead. It's caught up, taking a lead, but it's now pulling that person along. That's why they're being overtaken in the fall. And we take on that perception that, hey, instead of assuming that the person just jumped in mer merrily and eagerly into their faults, but instead we see that, hey, maybe that person was fighting that thing. Days, weeks, months, years, fighting desperately to try to avoid getting caught up in that thing and only, only for it to catch up with them and to now pull them along, we might have more sympathy and mercy for that person. I just got another example. Let's say you have a small boat and you're out in the bay and all of a sudden this big ship comes along and it passes by a little too close and you get it caught up in the wake of that larger vessel coming by. That thing could, you know, capsize your boat, amen? Or they might send a couple lines down, to, you know, connect it to your boat and pull you along. You know, they're overtaken, they're, they're consumed, they're overwhelmed, amen? They're capsizing, they're, they're getting pulled along by something that has a greater power and speed and velocity to pull them along. When that person is overtaken in the fall, amen, they are no longer in control of their circumstances. But it is once again caught up with them. It's, it's, it reminds me of, you know, Cain and Abel, and we talks about sin, you know, crouching at the door, 
And if you don't repent, get your attitude together, that thing's going to pounce on you and you're going to become its victim. That's what's happening here when somebody is overtaken in a fall. It's pounced on them and now it has taken the lead. And like I said, um, if we have the mindset, as we see here, ye which are spiritual, realize that your priority is not to battle that person once again and beat them and embarrass them and get them told and give them their two cents. And even worse, here's something that happens. You finally get the time where they're open to hear from you and you just got your spiritual briefcases full of all the aggravation that you they gave you previously that you've been stockpiling and now I finally got the moment to tell them all these things I've been storing up, you know, when I should have been supposedly praying for their they're in mercy, having mercy for them, but now I finally get the chance to tell them and speak my mind, and I just open up those briefcases and I just throw that pile of stuff on them. You know, are you really ministering to them, or are you throwing your frustrations on them? That's not ministry, and that's why God says, "Ye which are spiritual." You know, just because you know a few passages, don't know doesn't mean that you're being spiritual when you're ministering to somebody who's been overtaken in the fall. If you're truly spiritual, you're not coming in with, once again, your agenda, and now I finally get to tell them about themselves. And I got a list of all their, you know, failures. Okay, you did this, you did that, and I told you not to do this, and you did it anyway. And, oh, I'll give you three more of these and another five of those, and I'm going to get them told. That's not spiritual. That's a, a beatdown in the name of God that God did not sanction you to do because he wants us to come in with love. You know, we see the pattern with Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ, Christ never publicly embarrassed people. Amen? He would say, he wouldn't justify stuff. He said, go and sin no more. But he didn't sit there and for the next hour, oh, I got a good sermon for you. I'll just beat you down by all your stuff and all the things you did. No, he would tell you, go and sin no more and show you mercy. So that's why it's so important here. Amen? Somebody is overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. <laughs> That's a key phrase. And we just see further. Ye which are spiritual, restore somebody in the spirit of meekness. You're not coming in, once again, I'm superior. You're coming in, if you're spiritual, in the spirit of meekness. You're coming in with humility. I'm not better than you. Hey, I understand. Or I may not even understand what you're doing, what you're struggling with. What I, I may not understand it, but hey, you know, I'm showing you the love of God. You know, I'm coming to benefit you not to beat you down. Amen? Praise the Lord. So if you see somebody falling in sin, the key thing is that you attempt to reach them in love instead of a spirit of contempt. You know, because you might similarly be struggling with something at some point in your life and you wouldn't want somebody to approach you that way. You know, Christ came to alleviate the burden of sin. Not to add to it with scrutiny, criticism, and hard heartedness. Once again, Christ came to alleviate the burden of sin. Not to add a further burden with, scrut with critical scrutiny and hard heartedness. God did not do that. Christ did not do that. Praise the Lord. I know I've been quoting R.C. Chapman a lot, amen, and I actually have another quote from him that is really so meaty, <laughs> it's so full of meat. But as it related to um, coming in and correcting people, R.C. Chapman, who's known as the Apostle of Love during his time period, he said, when mutual intercession takes the place of mutual accusation, then will the differences and difficulties of brethren be overcome. Just listen to that. When mutual intercession, focus on interceding for people. When that takes the place of mutual accusation, coming in to point fingers, he says, then will the differences and difficulties of brethren be overcome. So quite frankly, we can infer from that statement that he's saying that if we spent more time coming with the mindset of praying for people, 
we wouldn't have to worry about being so critical of people. And when you look at the word mutual in that, um, it should be joining together to pray for each other, not joining together, as I said, to point fingers at each other. So that's the key thing. What is the mindset when dealing with somebody who is struggling, you know, with something? Are you coming in to be critical or are you coming in to be supportive? Are you coming in to mutually point fingers or blame shift? Or are you coming together to intercede? Let us come together to help overcome what has overtaken you with a fall. That should be the mindset. Praise the Lord. Actually, I'm going to stop there today because um, about to enter into a new section, but we're getting um, closer to, we're like 50-something minutes in, so I think we'll stop there today. And we'll continue on next week um, talking about forgiving and blessing others because I think that's a really heavy subject to tackle. Amen? So we'll do that. Right, so let's all close in a word of prayer. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for giving us the opportunity once again to come into your throne of grace, Lord, or come before your throne of grace. We thank you, Father, for this. We thank you for all the incredible blessings that you pour out to us. We praise you, Father, for um, just being our... our Heavenly Father, a fortress of strength, uh, a banner of protection, a comforter, a guide, a provider, a healer, a life giver, uh, a teacher. Just so many different things, Father, that you do for us. And we just praise and thank you, Father, for this. We give you the glory, honor, and praise, Father, that you would just continue to bless us and give us opportunities also to be a blessing in the lives of other people. We thank you, Father, for this. We cannot thank you enough for all the, the incredible, wonderful, unquantifiable things that you do in our lives. So many things, Father, that um, even the things we notice pale in comparison to the totality of all the things you do. Yes. So we do praise and thank you, Father, for this today. Right now, we continue to praise and thank you, Father, for the way in which you bless each one of us that we got up today, that you continue to provide all our needs according to your riches and glory. We pray, Father, for those, Father, who are going through trials and tribulations. Right now, uh, we, we lift up um, Ms. Dolores once again, Lord, that you would um, saturate her with divine healing, Father. Give her an appetite. Uh, restore her um, brain capacity, the recollections, the... Um, the involuntary movements, the voluntary movements, just everything, Father. Do a complete and total healing. And we just praise you, Father. Give wisdom to Kel Kelly and Ed, Father. We praise and thank you, Father, for um, just pouring out your peace upon them, divine wisdom as to how to proceed. But we do thank and praise you most of all, Father, that um, your daughter, Dolores, does know you. And we praise and thank you, Father, for quickening her spirit, Lord, and her body. We just give you praise, honor, and glory for this, Lord. And right now, as we prepare to enter in another week, we thank you, Father, for all the things that are in store. Father, um, that you would pour out your wisdom upon us as to what you would have us to do, what you would have us to say in terms of our interactions with people. We praise and thank you to give us witty ideas as we go to our places of work, that we can um, just be elevated in the sight of those we work with, not for personal glory or gain, but that through our witness, Father, and through our character, through our exceptional work, people will be drawn to us. Most of all, Father, let the aura, the aroma of um, your righteousness and your holiness flow through us, Father, that it would touch people. And we pray, Father, that love would be fully manifested in us. And even as we've been studying, that we would grow in it more and more on a daily basis. We thank you, Father, that even in the times we fail, Father, you forgive us and show us how to conduct ourselves better in the future. And we just give you the praise, the honor, and glory, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.